Easter, everybody. It is so good to see everyone here today. Hi, my name is Eric Bucci, and I am the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church, and we're so delighted you're in your, our second of five uh, Easter services. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad we're back in church for Easter. Come on. Yeah. Because yeah. last year we were at home. And so I just want to welcome everybody and everyone that's watching online as well. If this is your first time here, I just want to let you know that we're so glad that you're here, and I really mean that that it's a privilege and an honor that you've chosen to come here today. I, I pray that after our time here today, that you'll be able to experience more of the presence of God, and you'll know how much God loves you and how he has good plans for you, both a hope and a future, and today. So I want to encourage you with that. Hey, a couple, real quickly, uh, we like to do this once a year. We call it our Easter survey. And if you guys could do that, we're going to pull out these cards. Uh, we sent, gave it to you when you came in. And the cards on the back side, it has a place where you can put things down. We like to try to do is, is ask you questions and see uh, different things we could do to encourage you and what we could do uh, as, a, as a church as far as for, um, you know, sermon series and all that. What Jesus would do, Jesus would ask questions. He would ask, people would ask him questions and he would answer questions. And so he would talk about all sorts of things. And so we want to be able to do that as well. And you can see in our annual survey, you just want to pull that out. It says, what are the greatest areas of stress you're experiencing? And if you're like me, I, I, I don't, I'm going to check them all, <laughs> all right? I check, check every single one. Uh, so we would go ahead and check the things that are important to you. That'd be great. Also, um, you know, what are the greatest barriers uh, to you knowing God? What are some things that are happening that's causing you difficulty with the Lord? And so we want to help you make those next steps. Listen, we're all in this together. And then we'll talk more about this a little bit later. So go ahead and fill that out. Let's get right to our, our time today when we're talking about Easter and talking about dying to live. Dying to live. I, I mean, this last, last uh, year now, it's been over a year, we've been like shut up and put in homes and can't go out different places. And, and I, I've been dying to live and, and was so happy my parents were here in the last service. They haven't been in Connecticut for over a year. It was so good. I was dying for having them coming back to here again. They got all their shots, and it's almost like you're like a dog. Your dog got the shots and, and neutered, and it's all good to go. I mean, it's like crazy what's going on, right? So they, they're here, and it was a great time. It's so exciting to see them here. And we're just dying to live. We want to we wanna get back to life. And the truth of the matter is, in order to find life, often we have to die. We have to die to our own ambitions. We have to die to things that would hold us back. And so this is what we're talking about today, and I just want to encourage you with that. This is, a, I have a public service announcement from Jesus today. Can I just share the public service announcement from Jesus? It's found in Revelation 1.17. Here it goes. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Now, can I hear hello for that? Come on. Come on, give me a hand. All right, you guys can do better than that. The last service had you beat. Come on, one more time. All right. Hey, listen, you know what? There's nothing wrong with celebrating the truth. And so if we can celebrate all sorts of things. We're not celebrate the truth. And so Jesus has in us, he beat the power of death, everybody. And so it's a lot to do that. We went through the survey, but I just want to introduce to you a spider monkey. And uh, if you're familiar with spider monkeys, they're, they're interesting creatures. They're very smart. They're very, uh, very interesting creatures. But one of the ways that you want to trap them, poachers, what they'll do in and, and, and South India and different places, they have a little trap in which they try to get them. I'm going to go ahead and show you a quick video that kind of explains a little bit. Go ahead, guys. So here you have some of the people from South India. They'll put a special uh, food in, in this jar. Sometimes they use a coconut. What happens is... The spider monkey sees it, smells it, and puts his hand in the jar. And what it will start to do is grab it, and he can't get himself out of it because as long as he's holding on to the food or the bananas or whatever it is in there, he cannot pull it out. And that's all they have to do. They sit there, and all this guy has to do, all this guy, all this monkey has to do is let go and die to what's inside of that jar, but it says, I will not let go. I must have this situation. And what happens is the poachers come, the poachers get them, and that's it. That's all they have to do. All the monkey has to do is let go. Now, none of you are monkeys here, I assume, and none of you do the same thing. Thank you. None of you do the same thing as that. But I've also, I was going to show you a different video, but I decided not to show it because it was actually quite, 
wasn't humane. But what they also do is they'll take a coconut like this and drill a hole in it. And they'll put bananas and stuff. And the monkey will go in there or get it. And then they'll hold it this. And what's so amazing that, that the monkey that I saw in the video would not don't go there right now. Stay in the service. <laughs> go after. But the monkey hold, held on to it. I couldn't show you the video because it was kind of sad. The monkey actually died. And it would not let go what was inside of it. It would not let go until it died. And so I don't know if any of us are the same way. We're trying to grab things, grab what our culture says is important, trying to grab control, trying to grab happiness, trying to grab church and being noticed and liked and trying to please God and we just want to hold on to it. What's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. If it becomes more important than God himself, we keep on holding on to it. And what happens is we go nuts and we don't want to do that. We want to be able to be free and God wants us to learn to die in order to be free, you have to be dying to really live. And it's, 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 a, it's something you see in botany. It's something you see in everything. If people really want to move ahead, they have to be willing to die to their own desires and own ambitions to really get free. You see, in Matthew 16, 25, this is what Jesus says. If you try to hang on to your life, like that monkey holding on, you try to hang on to your life, you will lose the poachers will get you. The poachers of materialism. The poachers of worry and anxiety. The poachers of never measuring up. And so, but if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. So the way to live is to die. Now I'm not talking literally physically dying. But dying to the things inside you that would hold you up. See, Jesus goes on to say this. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul. Is anything worth more than your soul? Is it really worth losing it all? Is it really worth losing everything you have just to gain what you think is important for the moment? You see, and this is the one of the first point to this. There can be no resurrection without death. All right? How do you rise something unless it dies? And this is what God would have for us today. He wants us to die to things inside of us. And Jesus goes on to say in John 12, 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So what happens? Something has to die first. Jesus was talking of himself. Jesus was the seed. He lay down and he died. And as a result of his death came a germination of an entire new type of people called Christians, little Christ. And why? Because he was willing to die down. He was willing to lie down and he was willing to die. And this is what Jesus says. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life. Now I'm not suggesting, you're like, well, I'm doing great. I hate my life. No. We're not talking about hating your life, but compared to God. You see, God will have no seconds. Now, it sounds like, what is God, some egotistical monster that, that he has to have all these accolades? Is that what kind of God? No, we're not, that's not what we're talking about. You see, you're created by God for God. You are made by God for God. That's, that's like your DNA. Uh, imagine, if you will, if you have a plant life in your house and you have, you have sun lamps, and these sun lamps are used to grow, grow whatever you're growing, the flowers you're growing. But, you know, that's an artificial light. And it really never gets to its full potential. There's nothing like natural light. And many of us are living with the so-called sun lamps that we've produced or allowing ourselves to be in our lives. And God wants to blow the roof off and let his light shine. And you're made for that light. But what we're doing is we're putting up with sunlights when we can have the sun. Unlimited source of sun and the atmosphere of acres and acres of growth and God would have that for us so he who loves his life will lose it and who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life I like what Martin Luther says he's just what he says he said actually he said until a man is nothing God can make nothing out of him until a man or a woman is nothing God can make nothing out of him the most difficult people to deal with are people that think they have it all together. Can I hear an amen from the parents? <laughs> Sorry, kids. Don't try this at home. All right, let's move on. 
1 Corinthians 15, 1 says this. Let me now remind you, this is the Apostle Paul. Now, what we're doing right now, we're summarizing what Easter is all about. The Apostle Paul begins to speak. He's one of the founding apostles. He's number 13. And this is what he says. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before you welcomed it then. And you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you. You see, <laughs> what God has to offer us, everybody, is good news. It's not bad news. Unfortunately, a lot of people in the church make it sound like bad news. Walk around, you can't do this and you can't. We, what church you go to? I go to the church of cannot. Can't do this, can't do that. It's all about rules. It's all about trying to measure up. It's all trying to earn God's favor. And the good, I have good news for you. You can't earn God's favor, no matter how hard you try. He wants you to give up so you can go up. But you cannot earn his favor. You can only respond to his favor. So it's good news that saves you if you continue to believe. And so, uh, and so that's what we talked about. Now, I passed on to you what was most important had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. You see, God took our place. And you don't think you have problems? You don't think you have issues in your life? Well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm not a bad person, really. You think you're all that? Let me ask you a question. If I had the ability today, as we walked out of here today, we gave you a device. And you put this thing on your, on your smartphone. And this smartphone, what it could do, it could read every thought you thought and everything you said throughout an entire week. And imagine we have the ability to come back next week, and we're going to take one of you at a time. We're going to roll the, roll the kind of like go through a lottery. We're going to pick you out. And what we're going to do is we're going to plug that thing into the screen, and we're going to show everyone what you thought and, you, and you, what you thought and what you said through the whole week, and we're going to invite the people to watch. How many would show up? <laughs> okay. The reason, there's one of them. Okay, good for you. Give that man a pizza. Okay. <laughs> I mean, no one would do that, right? Except for one person who's got it all together, okay? I, I got to meet this guy. I know where he is. Okay. Oh, the little guy. Okay. Okay. I get it. Okay. The baby can do it. All right. And so anyhow, we'll be dreaming, dreaming about bottles all day long, right? The monk bottles. All right. So, but no one... <laughs> so no, no one would show up, right? Because you know the stuff in you that's not right. Come on, everybody. We're, absolutely. So what is this? Christ died for our sins. Our sins, just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Now, what's so interesting, this is written by the apostle Paul in 50 AD or 55 AD. He's talking about scriptures. That's right. There was circulation of letters going around and eyewitnesses. Go on. He was seen by Peter. That's the apostle Peter. And by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. How do you get 500 people to see an illusion? Let's move on. Most of whom are still alive, though some have died. So you could interview. When Paul wrote this letter, you could interview the people. Yeah, I was there. I saw it. I saw it. Even Josephus, a Jewish historian, writes about Jesus rising from the dead. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. And he goes on and talks about the resurrection. People are saying that once you die, that's it. You're done. You're just, you're just, a, you're just like dirt. You never come back. That's what he says. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And, a, and our hope in Christ is only for this life. We're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. In other words, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, and there's nothing more than this life, that we are to be pitied. We are wasting our time. This is a complete waste. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. What's the sense? That's what he's saying. But in fact, Christ has been raised from dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who died. He is that seed that died, that from his death came a germination of new life. Now, Jesus rose again from the dead. Because he rose, we rise. He was the first to continue to go on. So there could be no resurrection without death. And Jesus died to bring us life. Why did he die? Well, no one, Jesus says, can take my life from me. Jesus did not. By the way, Jesus is not some anorexic, tall, skinny, blue-eyed, 
long-haired hippie from the 70s that walks around like this. No, Jesus was a strong man. Jesus said things that ticked people off. Jesus bucked the system. Jesus had his church of his day very upset so they wanted to kill him. And this is what he says. It wasn't like he was such a wimp that they put him on the cross. No, anything further from that. He says what Jesus said, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. He was the most humble, yet the most strong person in the world. What a place to be. Wouldn't you like to be humble and strong? You have such confidence knowing who you are. That's what Jesus did. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. He was the sacrifice for us. All of us deserve death, but Jesus took our place. You see, 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul is talking here again. You see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Now, who's the, who's the man? Adam. Adam and Eve, the first prototypes of what we're called to be. Just as everyone dies becomes, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Now, this kind of bothered me growing up, and I used to struggle with this. Why on earth would God sentence the entire civilization just because one guy screwed up. That's not fair. Why would God, why would we have to be separated from God and have all the trouble we're having just because a guy and his wife decided to do the wrong thing? It doesn't seem fair, does it? It doesn't seem fair that one person. Well, let's continue. Everyone dies because we all belong to Adam. Everyone who belongs to Christ will be given the new life. Just as one man died, came sin. Here's the brilliant part. One man dies, the second Adam, and we're all right with God. Now, why would God do that? And it doesn't seem just. In fact, I don't like Christianity for that reason. In fact, I think it's kind of something fundamentally wrong with it. You tell man wrote it because, you know, why would you do something like that? Well, I have news for you. We give a lot of stock in giving samples of society. We'll take a scientific sample and, and it, the more people you have involved, the different people of the country, you can take a poll. You know what a poll is? A Zogby poll or a Gallup poll or Pew Research. And they'll go around and they'll call people and ask questions and they'll take a temperature of our country. And if they do it right, it's, pretty, it's a pretty exact science. And actually, you can get a temperature of what a culture believes through scientific polls. Taking a survey and then averaging it out, 55% of the people think this, da-da-da-da-da, okay? So what Adam and Eve were, they were a sampling of what you and I would do if we were put in their position. And they chose a certain way because they represent us, because they are us. So just as one man screwed it up, one man made it right. And that man is Jesus Christ. Now, which one do you want to follow? And so Jesus did it for us because God is a God of justice. There has to be justice. And you're like, why does there have to be justice? Why does there have to be justice? When I see the news and I see an older person or someone that's innocent get uh, manhandled or hit or shot, something inside you says, that's not right. Something has to be done. That's called justice. You're made in God's image. You have the same heartbeat as he does in that regard. You see, there has to be justice. And Jesus is the only one that can do it. He's the second Adam. He's the one that laid down his life. Now, what basically happens is this. If you're in the Arctic Circle during winter, if you're in another ship and you want to go into the waters and the areas, they have to have an icebreaker. And then what they'll do is they'll put a boat, like a tugboat, and they'll put a big wedge on there that break the ice, and then the other boat can follow along. What Jesus did is he pioneered a new frontier of freedom for us. And that freedom comes from us having, getting into the death of ourselves, that we can find the life of ourselves. See, but there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. He's the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. So let me explain. I know it's a little confusing. And people say, wait a minute here. I thought, the, are you saying we're going to have to soul sleep and be? No, no. Jesus said it very clear to the man on the cross. The man on the cross, when Jesus was dying on the cross, the man said to Jesus, remember me. 
And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He also tells, the apostle Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when we die and you're giving your life to Christ, you're immediately with Jesus Christ in a place called paradise, a heaven. But there comes a day where we're gonna have a resurrected body What's going to happen is our, we're going to have a reconstitution of our earthly body. It's a mystery, but the good news is when you die, you go to heaven and you're with God. But one day you'll have a new body, a glorified body. Now, if you want to know that, come back next week. So the first of the harvest. You see that, everybody? I hope you're following, tracking with me. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. So there could be no resurrection without death. You have to die in order to to live. Jesus died to bring us life. He is the prototype. He is the one. He's the one that began the new way. He is the second Adam. I want to follow the second Adam, not the first Adam. Our first parents got it wrong. I want to follow Jesus. And the good news is the only way you can do it is through Jesus, not through hard work. So to experience resurrection, you must die to self and live in Christ. Die to self and not live for somebody else. Die for self and live in Christ, which means you're in fellowship with Christ. You're part of Christ. In Luke 9, 23, it says the following, and he said to all, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Here we are, the dying. And listen, if you've given your life to Jesus, how many know it's a daily decision? I'm not saying that you're unsaved every time you make a mistake. But what can happen is you can limit your life. I'm not saying every time you make a mistake, oh, I'm going to hell. No. But what can happen is you can bring hell in your life. You can miss a lot of the opportunities. You can get to the end of your life and say, I made it into heaven, but what do I have to show for it? I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that I'm not ashamed at the end. Right? And so what is it? You have to pick up your cross and follow Christ daily. The truth of the matter is when you die, you really live. Think about it. If we're living for people's opinions, living to try to be happy, you can never supply everything you need. Only God can do that. But when you release yourself of that and you connect to God, your creator, you're made by God for God until you give your life to God and live for God, you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt other people. How much better is it to go back to your original design? How much better is it to get rid of those room lamps and get rid of the sun lamps and get the real sun? And this is what God calls us for. So he says... Deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. And he says, follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus said this to us today. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All religions of the world are going to have to go through Jesus. The only assurance of salvation is Jesus. I'm out, on the, I'm out on the board of heaven saying, save, not save. Jesus will do that. The only assurance of salvation is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he tells us to spread the news around the world for that reason. So, I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the truth of the matter. He's put eternity into man's heart. You know inside of you there's something more than this. If there's nothing more than this, you wouldn't long for something. I like what C.S. Lewis says. He says the following. Said, he said, if I find in myself a desire which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Why would you long for something unless it was there? Why do the birds that want to fly south, there's something instinctive that they know they're supposed to migrate? My friends, there's something inside you that wants to fly towards God. There's a migration that you're designed for, and everything's telling you it's not, but it's inside of you. Oh, you wouldn't long for it. And today is the day. Whether you're a believer or not, are you willing to die so you can live? And I want to encourage you today that God has good plans for us. And no matter who you are, no matter what you're going through right now, how many of us are not dying enough? Maybe there's a situation you need to die to that longing to get to control somebody. Maybe you're trying to control your life. Maybe you're trying to measure up to your own self. Why not die to that and live to Jesus Christ? He says, Jesus comes to you. I'll have no one else. He's the only way. Have you given your life to Christ? And are you dying daily? So this is for everybody. 
whether you're giving your life to Christ or not. I'm going to ask you at this time just to pull out your survey one more time. I want to conclude our survey today. The very bottom of your sheet that says A, B, C, or D, there's a spiritual survey. And I want to encourage you to just pull that arrow out quick. Let me ask you, you are one of these four. You're either an A, a B, or a C, or a D. Now, we're not talking about grades. We're talking about category. Here's the first category, A. I've already put my trust on Jesus. I've done it already. I've, I've given my life to Christ. I've done it. Maybe that's you today. And what I would encourage you, are you dying daily? You want to have more life? Die daily. And I'm saying to myself as well, it's the first one. Second one is this. Maybe you're in this category. I'm beginning to trust on Jesus today. You know what? I'm beginning to realize there's something more than this. I want to give my life to Christ today. And if that's you, I want to pray a prayer in a few moments. The third one is this. I, I, I would like to consider it a bit more first. I, I got some questions. And I, I got the whole idea with this. I don't understand everything. I was in that state for a period of time myself. It took me over a year. And I was struggling with it. Why did God do this? Why does God allow suffering? I went through all these questions. And, you know, we're okay with that. This church is a safe place for you to explore Christ. We're not here to hit you over the head. Listen, we're not about behavior in this church, though behavior matters. But behavior without giving your life to Christ falls short. we much rather have you come to Jesus Christ. And when you come to Jesus Christ, your behavior is going to change. But you're not saved by your behavior. You were saved by Jesus Christ. But you're saved for good behavior because good behavior helps you and helps everyone else. But it's not about rules. It's about relationship. Okay? So I'd like to consider a bit more first. Or maybe it's D. I don't ever intend to make this decision. I hope that's not you, but if it is, be honest. And I pray that you would become more like Jesus. You know, it's very interesting. A lot of people like to play church, and it reminds me of a story of a pig and a chicken. A pig and a chicken heard there was an opportunity to raise money to help people going through a difficult time. And so the chicken told the pig, hey, listen, I'm going to donate some eggs to the specials, you know, to help feed. What, can you donate some bacon? And the pig goes, wait a minute here. You're not all in. If I do that, I'm all in. And I want to encourage you to go all in. <laughs> I want to encourage you to go all in with the Lord. I want to encourage you to give God your best and watch what he'll do with the rest. I'm telling you, there's so much more better days ahead for all of us whether you're in Christ or not. If you'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ today, I'm going to pray a prayer right now for a, a rededication or for the first time. Just want to repeat in your own heart, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose to step down. I choose to die to myself and say yes to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, based upon my confession in you, that I am now your child in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we think you got born again. We believe that. Let's get our hand out of the jar. Let's let go and let God make a difference in our life. I just want to conclude with, real quickly, give you an opportunity to give. If you're a guest here, there's no obligation to give that for anybody. This is an opportunity. But I tell you, my parents were here last service, and I spoke to them, and I said, I saw my parents all their lives being generous and trusting God, and God always provided for us. So there's different ways you can give. You can text to 77977, push pay app, cornerstonecheshire.com, or send, send it through the mail, or as you walk out of here today, if you could hand these boxes, these cards in, it would be awesome. All right, everybody? God bless you. Listen, let's, let's die so we can live. Let's be everything that God has called us. Happy resurrection, everybody. Let's walk in the grace and the power of God. We're going to close with one more benediction to you. Would you stand with us one more time?
church said together. Amen. He is risen. Come on, one more time. He is risen. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Happy Easter.